I've, uh, you know, I've watched your company kind of grow here the last, you know, several years. Um, and just, you know, would love to talk to you about obviously your organization, what you guys are doing, but then from a breaking perspective, I'm really interested in learning more about just kind of the technology and the design and kind of the background and how it works. So, so I appreciate you joining me. So you are, so are you, are you the founder and CEO of protein electric? No, I'm the, I'm the CEO, but I'm not the founder. Okay. Um, the, the business doesn't really have the, their, there was never really a founder of the business that there was a, there was a previous owner. Um, and then it, it changed hands about 11 or 12 years ago. Um, and then our investors have installed various different, um, professional, uh, management teams over the, over the years. Sure. Yeah, I got it. Okay. So can you walk me through just maybe a kind of brief background of, you know, who you guys are and what you do, that sort of thing. Yeah, sure. So, Protein, um, protein formed out of, as I said earlier, a, a previous business around uh, 2008. Um, and really the, the intention from day one was, was to take a, an electric drive technology um, that had been, that had started to be developed for an in-wheel electric drive and, and take that into commercialization and, and, and ultimately mass production. So we've been we've been on this journey for a little bit over ten years. I joined the business in um, in early two thousand and nine, um, and I've worked my way through the business and was was fortunate enough to be appointed CEO last year. Um, so what what Protein is trying to do is is take an electric motor, uh, an inverter, so power electronics, uh, embedded uh, software and control and put that in one unit that fits inside the wheel rim of a conventional passenger car sized wheel rim. So we have a, a product that fits inside an 18 inch wheel rim. We have a product that fits inside a 16 inch wheel rim. We're working on some designs that would fit inside a 19 and a 20 inch wheel rim. And, and broadly speaking, you know, as, as wheel rims get bigger, cars get bigger and our motor gets a little bigger and it generates more torque. From a, I guess from like a, a design perspective, you know, speaking like of braking, just talk about braking. Yeah. So do you, you, obviously you can't have a traditional rotor caliper pad yeah. all, so, all squeezed down there. So how, walk me through that, how that's designed. Sure. So, so if you look at, if you, if you kind of look at our design and you'll see pictures on our website, if you, if you, if you want to have a look. And um, the main change that we've made is when we look at the, the space we need for the motor and the space that we still need for the suspension components and all the, you know, to make sure that the bushings are in the right place and the steering, you know, that the, the, all the geometry is still correct. We actually have more space around the, the kind of on a higher radius. Um, so what we've done with the brake system is that we've, we've turned the brake disc inside out. So instead of the, the disc mounting around the hub and the caliper coming over the top of the disc, mm -hmm. the caliper actually mounts from the inside and the disc is, is a higher radius. So we're coming, and it's kind of what, what we've called an inside out disc. And you can see that, you know, there's been a number of instances, but, but the one probably the most often seen is, is on a Harley Davidson Buell motorcycle. Mm, okay. On the, front, on the front wheel of that, you can, you, it's very easy to see because it's a motorcycle, you know, um, and you can see they've got an inside out disc. And that, what that means is per, per unit um, pressure, because we're actuating on a higher radius, we've got more torque per bit more, more newton meters per bar, if you like, um, on the brake solution. So we need slightly less pad area um, to achieve the same braking performance. Obviously, thermal mass-wise, the brake disc is of the same sort of mass, mm -hmm. but it's not it's not central on the hub. It's out there at the at the higher radius, and the and the disc is coming from the inside going going out. Yeah. Sorry, the caliper is coming from the inside going out. Yeah, interesting. So you, um, so do you do you all manufacture? Do you have a do you, have, do you outsource that? Do you have someone else that's, that's did you design all the caliper, all the brake components, and have it sourced for you all? No, we've we've worked um, we work collaboratively with a number of partners through the through the years. Our, the key partner that we've worked with is uh, Alcon Components, mm -hmm. um, who I think you you probably sure. know, yeah, very familiar. Uh, Alistair and the and the team yep. there. Um, and, you know, 
But over the over the years, I think with Alcon, we probably put our brake system on forty, roughly forty different kinds of uh, different you know models of vehicle. Mm -hmm. Obviously, not all of them are in, in mass production, but um, yeah. but you know it, it's been a very scalable solution from oh, wow. from light commercial to you know to, to sort of A segment, B segment, small cars, SUVs, mm -hmm. um, passenger you know passenger saloon cars. So so it's been a very um, sort of scalable uh, and adaptable solution. Um, and we're, you know, we continue to work with them on refinements today and, and, and continue to work on improvements to that system. Yeah. And from a friction material perspective, you know, like the actual pad itself, are you able to use kind of, for lack of a better term, off the shelf type formulations that, yeah, would, yeah. that would normally go into the vehicle? You can still use that type of formulations? Yeah, it's it's interesting. So so we've you know up until now really we've we've used regular um, disc materials which is uh, cast iron uh, and yeah off the off the shelf pad pad materials okay. with regular coolant friction coefficients. Sometimes we've we've made our own molds for the for the pads and sometimes we've just kind of for for, for simplicity and, and and speed we've we've laser cut them out of existing or water right. cut I think we use and then you, you kind of mentioned stopping power or stopping like so from a stopping distance or stopping power perspective it's just as good if not better I guess with this this design or is there challenges with I guess depending on the vehicle the stopping power stopping distance yeah so what we have done in in pretty much all cases is we've replicated the foundation braking system that was on the vehicle before oh, okay um, so obviously our motor it, it, there is, is providing propulsion torque, but it also provides regen torque. But as, as, as I'm sure your, your viewers will know, you know, that the, the power uh, to stop a vehicle is always far higher than the power to propel a vehicle. You know, often people that understand about brakes think, well, why can't you just use the motor to stop the, the vehicle? And say, so, well, you know, if I wanted to perform an emergency stop with it, the motor would have to be five times bigger than it needs to be to make the vehicle go from you know zero to sixty in in four seconds or five okay. seconds, whatever it is. So um, we we've taken the approach that you need to design the, the the system to replicate the base vehicle foundation braking system in terms of of um, you know ma uh, maximum G stops, um, AMS fade test, gross stop and descent, all those sort of tests. Um, we're as we get more engaged with our customers and 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 push forward closer to mass production, we're seeing some actual changes in there. Hmm. We're seeing the discussions of of you know what we what we've called regen first strategy of where you try and use all the capacity in the motor and the battery before you engage the brakes. I, I noticed Audi just just uh, pushed a, a, a published a, a paper about that uh, recently, and that's something that we're also working on. Hmm. Um, and, and with that, and, and some slight changes to, to disc and pad material, the, the talk of kind of vehicle lifetime breaks. So you mm -hmm. know, no, no change, certainly no changes of, of discs and, and, and fewer changes of pad material because 90% of your braking is done regeneratively by the motors. Um, and and if, you, if, you, if you move to some of the more advanced and more modern materials and coatings on those materials, your, your discs just don't wear. Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of you know, and, and actually there 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 are some improvements also on NVH, um, because conventional materials and electric vehicles some NVH challenges because you don't you don't actuate the brake as much. So when you yeah. do, they're noisy, and you know. So there's a whole bunch of innovations in there that that we're starting to to work on, um, in terms of those materials and in terms of thinking about the the brake life and the brake service uh, over the lifetime of the vehicle. From a, I guess from like a controls or actuation perspective, mm -hmm. I mean, is this more, I guess, I don't know if the proper term, but like break by wire. I mean, is this all more electronically controlled EBV type stuff versus hydraulics? Or? Yeah, so, so that's, that's um, we, we've designed our system to integrate with kind of, I'd say conventional systems. So, you know, um, uh, the, 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 the Brake control systems that you find on on electric vehicles in the market today, okay. you know, they have an element of regen, usually just on the gas pedal, so so simulated engine braking, um, and there's very little regen on the on the brake pedal, and then uh, you know any time that there's any sort of 
and 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 that and any brake regenerates on the brake pedal is is kind of applied simultaneously with the friction brake, friction torque, mm -hmm. and that's relatively easy from a brake control perspective because your 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 hydraulic is always in charge, so your your existing ABS system is always kind of the dominant system, and all that happens if there's ever any any lockup or or or, or any um, loss of traction, it just ramps down the regen and the friction takes over. Oh. And so, so that's the kind of conventional system. And, and we, you know, we work in the same way as an electric, as, as an electric axle. We're just controlled over a can and, and, and the, the vehicle controller or the ESP system will demand a certain positive or negative torque from, from our, uh, our machine and we'll just deliver that. Um, as I said, um, as, as things advance, we're looking more about bringing the regen in first and not touching the friction brakes at all. And that's where you get to these more advanced systems where you have you have decoupled pedals, so the brake pedal's not no longer directly connected hydraulically, mm -hmm. or, 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 or there's more electronic support in there. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and there's more of a cooperative effort between the regen and the hydraulic. And even in ABS events, we're we're starting to use the motors to to yeah to really to do ABS okay. because they can they can actuate you know I don't know ten times faster than the if you if you think of the whole all the losses in the hysteresis that, you know in the hydraulic system and the valves opening and closing and all that you know compared to a, a kind of a, a motor in the corner just making sure that it's not slipping mm. you know there's a ten times faster response rate so we're able to control slip at the wheel you know in in a much narrower range that, than than a conventional abs uh, hydraulic yeah. abs system yeah. so that's that's the next generation that's where we're seeing things going yeah to change the subject real quick i want to go back talking about your company so protein electric so who so who is your ideal customer i mean is it literally like pretty flexible to where you guys can use your technology on passenger cars as well as big big huge you know class eight heavy duty trucks or i mean is there one it's kind of a, a bit bigger target for you versus another yeah so so that's a it's a good question you know i i think that um our you know our ultimate aim here is is for this technology to be adopted in in mass production automotive applications um but as you can see from the market you know we're not there yet um, so, so as we work up, you know, and, and for, for lots of very good reasons, you know, the, the industry has to gain confidence in the technology. Mm -hmm. It has to, it has to understand the, the, the cost, the benefits, the, the, the you know, to assure itself of that. It, um, so, so there's lots of good reasons why we're not, um, you know, we're not on the MEV platform today or, 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 um, on the Chevy Volt or, or whatever. Um, but so so uh, where 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 we are working hardest at the moment really is in in I, I would say two kind of applications or groups of applications. Mm -hmm. One is with uh, OEMs, but on on kind of niche applications, so on high performance applications, um, on on you know uh, yeah like like I said for, for example we're able to offer the, the, this idea of long range and all wheel drive so. If you look at many electric applications, when you switch from a two-wheel drive to an all-wheel drive, mm -hmm. your range goes down. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, and and it does that because the second drive st still uses energy, um, and they can't fit any more batteries. Well, because if you add a second axle with with our wheel motors, you've still got lots of space to add more batteries. So you've got this idea of being able to have all-wheel drive and longer range because we can fit another twenty or thirty kilowatt hours of battery in there. And so you 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 get you get the premium that you want with the performance, and you also get the premium with an extra 150 or 200 kilometers yeah. additional driving range. Yeah. So now, but obviously that that option is not going to be the base vehicle that they're going to you you're going to sell lots of. So that might be the option that you sell five or ten percent yeah. of your vehicles with with that option fitted. So so that's one space that 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 we've got some really interesting um, developments happening. The second space is is in the, I would say more of the commercial vehicle arena, where and and I say commercial, I don't mean like just heavy heavy goods vehicles, but but vehicles that are used um, for commercial means. So here I'm talking about 
like more fleet um, vehicles, delivery vehicles. Yeah. Um, you know, also bigger commercial vehicles, but and also things like delivery pods. Uh, uh, you know, people carriers and and, yeah. and these and these pods. Yeah. Where in those models, what we see is this this that's driven by the the TCO, so total cost of ownership of the vehicle. So in 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 for example a light commercial delivery vehicle you're really interested in one in the efficiency of the of the drive line and how many times you need to charge um, and also how much give in a given footprint of vehicle how much volume uh, how many you know how many packages can you fit in there or how much mass can you fit in there and that's where we see some advantage you know our our packaging benefits allow more you know you would allow, for example, Amazon to fit more packages in a five meter by two meter footprint than it would with a conventional drivetrain. It would also allow for a nice flat floor all the way through so the driver doesn't have to climb up steps. And so that saves the driver's knees. And, and again, you know, so you get all these ergonomic and packaging benefits that, that okay, maybe the wheel motors are a little bit more expensive to buy to start with, but when you think about the vehicle lifespan of three or five years and all those saved knee operations and saved package, you know, and, and additional packages that you get in the, in the vehicle, then all, all of a sudden it, it makes it a very, very simple economic equation. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I was going to ask you, kind of had me thinking too, you know, when you all um, have your product on a, you know, major program, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of vehicles have your system on it from a maintenance perspective. I mean, is that, has that been kind of a challenge with potential customers on just kind of understanding, okay, it's great technology. It works perfectly, but what if, you know, say a hundred thousand miles down the road, you need to start repairing some of this stuff. Are there, are there benefits to the maintenance side of it? Or are there definitely some things they're going to have to transition into and say, okay, this is going to have to, this is a different way of having to maintain these wheels or the, this system. Yeah. So uh, on the maintenance side, yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a very good point. We we are not designing the motor itself to be uh, a maintained component. It, it's uh, if it, if there's a problem with it, um, it's a it's a refit. And if you look at the way, pretty much all electric drive components in the market are um, are uh, worked on, they're they're all fit and replaced. So you know all Toyota hybrid Prius vehicles, you know, if there's a problem with the electric motor or a problem with the power control unit, the, the, the garage just takes it out, ships it to a central service station, they fit a new one and gotcha. and, and you carry on. We, we have, however, made sure that the, um, that the brakes are serviceable, you know, they need to be serviceable in the field and so we maintain that serviceability. Um, uh, and 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 with that also the sus the suspension components and and I should add that the wheels and tires entirely conventional wheels and tires so you right. have a puncture you change it in the same way that you would change a normal puncture and Got it. same thing with with if you dent the tire you know if you dent the rim you change it in the same way um, so uh, yeah uh, and 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 if you look actually at, at the the way that electric vehicles are are being maintained and serviced etc you see very 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 few you know, maintenance issues with the electric machines and the, and the power electronics. They're, they're not like combustion engines where you need to, you know, service components and change the oil and, and, you know, things wear out. There's very few moving parts. There's very few wear surfaces. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and the way that they're designed is that they're not very good at being taken apart and, and, and tinkered with and put back together. Um, yeah. So that's why you, you tend to make sure that the component lasts the lifetime it's required. And if you need a new, and if it breaks, then you need a new one. What about like from a horsepower or torque perspective? I mean, is it, is it pretty much standard or, or pretty similar to any other vehicle yeah. out there? Is it... so, so just to give you an example, in, in, our, um, in our 18 inch wheel motor, we're, we're generating 80 kilowatts, which is about 110 horsepower per, per wheel. So that's, you know, to a two-wheel drive, 220 horsepower, uh, all-wheel drive, 450 horsepower. Yeah. Um, yeah. Obviously, if, if you go up to a 19 or 20-inch motor, you know, we're going to add a you know, chunk more on that. So, yeah, you know, the, 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 uh, as you've seen with all electric vehicles out there, you know, the performance of these electric vehicles is pretty good um, compared to, you know, and 
and um, physics is still physics. So you still need a certain amount of torque to take you off the line and you still need a certain amount of power to push you through the air to get to, to certain speeds. So yeah, we're, we're, we're matching uh, the, the performance of, of, of those vehicles that are out there today. Okay. Yeah. Now your organization, are you all headquartered in the UK? Yeah. So we're, we're based uh, here just, just south of London. Um, and we've got our main uh, research and development center here in the UK. We've got an office in, in Detroit, Michigan. Um, and then we've got a, a further um, facility in Shanghai uh, and a small manufacturing center in, uh, in Tianjin, which is south of Beijing. So we're, you know, we've, we, as a company, we, we focused on, on those three key markets, North American, European, and, and China market. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, so that's where you find us you know, close to our customers. Okay, good. Well, Andrew, I, uh, I really appreciate your time today. This is